Well, good evening, everyone. We're going to wait just a few more seconds to let everyone into the room, but I want to welcome you very much to this uh, International Rule of Law Lecture. So we'll just hang on, if you don't mind, for a couple of, uh, uh, maybe about 30 seconds, and then we'll start. Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Amanda Pinto QC. I'm the chair of the Bar Council of England and Wales for 2020. And I am delighted to welcome you to our 14th annual International Rule of Law Lecture. We are very pleased that this event has become such a successful and important part of the Bar Council's work. The Bar Council's International Committee and team run an extensive program, which I am sure Stephen Thompson QC, the chair, will tell you about. But the International Committee is close to my heart, having been vice chair and then chair of the committee for several years myself. Its work is wide, fascinating and crucial. The International Committee's remit is uh, wide and we hold this annual event to inspire members of the bar, lawyers and law students to participate in activities that defend or promote the rule of law to promote greater awareness of the importance of the rule of law and to stimulate debate. And the Bar Council itself has been increasingly active in the defense of the rule of law in response to challenges both home and abroad in this year. Here in the UK, government ministers have attacked lawyers as lefties, activists and do-gooders merely for applying the law and doing their job on behalf of clients. And our government has only today debated the in, uh, Internal Market Bill, which admittedly will contravene international law and breach the EU-UK withdrawal agreement, willingly signed only a few months before. In both cases, the Bar Council has promoted the rule of law, often joining with colleagues at the Law Society and to defend the legal professions, as we have in other years, the independence of the judiciary. And looking abroad, the Bar Council with other bar associations has intervened in relation to several rule of law crises, including continuing attacks on the judiciary in Poland, the new national security law in Hong Kong, mass arrests of lawyers in Turkey, interference with the rights of lawyers in Zimbabwe, and violations of constitutional principles in Hungary and Samoa, to name but a few. Of course, the rule of law includes helping people to access justice. Last month, the Bar Council supported the 19th National Pro Bono Week, which celebrates the enormous contribution and commitment made by lawyers to pro bono. The Bar has always been committed to help those otherwise without access to justice, whether at home or abroad. Many barristers provide free legal advice or representation to those in need or volunteer their skills in other capacities, such as advocacy training or human rights training in other jurisdictions. I want to publicly recognize organizations within the bar which carry out excellent work in this field and which would welcome you to join them, such as the Inns of Court College of Advocacy, the Bar Count Human Rights Committee and Advocate, formerly the Bar Pro Bono Unit. So please do get in touch with the Bar Council's international team afterwards if you're interested in getting involved. But let me focus now on the rule of law lecture and may I just give you a little bit of the history. I'm delighted that we have consistently attracted outstanding speakers from across the globe to address us on burning issues concerning the international rule of law. And this year is no different. Since 2007, we have been privileged to hear from eminent judges, lawyers and public figures who have shared their unique viewpoint and the professional and personal challenges they face. They've come from all over the world, from as near as York and Northern Ireland to South Africa, Hong Kong to Canada, Ethiopia to Iran, as well as international courts uh, and the UN. 
When we celebrated the 10th anniversary of the lecture series in 2016, we published a book of the first 10 lectures. They make for a really interesting and thought provoking read. And I'd encourage you all to order a copy of the book, which is available from Wildies. Can't believe I sound like a salesman, but it is actually great. This evening, the Bar Council is absolutely delighted to welcome Judge Kimberly Prost, who is a judge in the International Criminal Court. Just before I introduce her, may I mention that the Bar Council has been very supportive of the ICC from the outset, contributing to the drafting of the Rome Statute and subsequently to the creation of the International Criminal Bar, including drafting the Ethics Guide for and supporting the Defence Bar before the ICC. Last year's Chair of the Bar, Richard Atkins QC, visited the ICC and we agreed to create a Lawyers Exchange Scheme which will allow junior ICC legal staff from civil law systems to gain experience in chambers of the adversarial common law process, and in turn, some of our young barristers to see ICC work close up. We hope this project will soon take off. Unfortunately, COVID rather overtook 2020. I'm proud that many members of the Bar of England and Wales have been involved at the ICC and its conflict specific iterations on behalf of defendants, victims and the prosecution. It's such valuable work, which we continue to encourage. And we've also had English judges sitting in the court, a tradition I hope will continue with Her Honour Judge Corner QC seeking election. Let me now introduce tonight's eminent speaker. Judge Kimberly Prost has dedicated much of her career to supporting international criminal justice. Her achievements in this field are frankly impressive. Judge Prost began her career as a federal prosecutor in Canada in 1982. And in 1987, she joined the Department of Justice's Crimes Against Humanity and War Crimes Unit in Ottawa, heading the Baltic team on possible prosecutions for genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. She was on the Canadian delegation for the negotiations of the Rome Statute for an International Criminal Court and the Rules of Procedure and Evidence. And in July 2000, she joined the Commonwealth Secretariat as head of the Criminal Law Section and Deputy Director of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Division. Zoom forward to 2005, she served as a judge, pre-trial and presiding of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the ICTY on the Popovich and Tolomir cases. In June 2010, she was appointed Ombudsman for the Security Council Al-Qaeda Sanctions Committee, serving for five years before joining the International Criminal Court. The topic on which Judge Prost has chosen to address us this evening, advancing the rule of law on the international stage, promises to give us an enlightening insight into some of the roles that she has had. And I'm delighted that despite the many rule of law challenges we've witnessed this year, quite apart from the pandemic, Kimberly has told me her lecture will be upbeat. So without further ado, I now hand over to you, Judge Prost. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Amanda. And it is really an honor for me to be here tonight to deliver this lecture, especially having been quite daunted looking at the list of previous speakers. So my thanks uh, to you and to the Bar Council for the invitation to speak tonight. My topic is indeed advancing the rule of law on the international stage. And to begin, and Amanda, your introduction is a perfect introduction because I was going to note that it's almost trite to say that these are dark times for the rule of law as a fundamental precept. And I need not list the disturbing challenges to it within states and regions the world over, including here in Europe. And you have now highlighted exactly some of those. And they are unfortunately all too familiar to us. And I'm afraid the news is no better internationally. The term rule of law and its related concepts have become difficult and sometimes impossible to advance it's almost prohibited language in resolutions, agreements, even statements. And in some quarters, it is reviled and blamed for many threats to our societies, in particular to our security. And so it follows, I could spend the time allotted this evening analyzing that phenomena, detailing the challenges 
for the rule of law in our time. But to do so at this particular moment, to focus on the darkness after this year, 2020, well, it would just be cruel. In fact, probably a violation of the prohibition against cruel and an inhumane treatment. Moreover, it's not necessary that I do so because my thesis is quite to the contrary. In my view, when you take into account the context of our global governance regime, it is in fact astounding as to what has been achieved and continues to be achieved in entrenching the rule of law on the international stage. Now by context, I mean this simple reality. I grew up in Canada where the rule of law is a given. From an early age forward, it would never have crossed my mind that there was any other system of order. And I imagine for some of you, it was exactly the same. But when I started to work in the international sphere, it came as quite a shock to learn that this is not the case for the vast majority of the people in the world. In several countries, it's the opposite. The rule of law is explicitly rejected. And at many others, it may be recognized or cited, but in practice, it is not implemented because of capacity or corruption or for a myriad of other reasons. And from that perspective, I think the enormity of the task is more clear. We're trying to entrench the rule of law when the support for it within the relevant constituency is dependent on a small minority. So with this in mind, despite setbacks and despite all the current challenges, I believe the advancements are quite significant and reflection upon them should serve to strengthen our determination to press on with the rule of law campaign. History tells us to persist. There are several examples of this progress in different spheres of the international world, but I've selected two discrete subject areas to illustrate the point, international criminal justice and international sanctions. I should also acknowledge that my comments will have somewhat of a personal element, perhaps more so than a normal commentary on the rule of law. That is because as I reflect on my legal career, it occurs to me I'm a bit like Forrest Gump, the character that Tom Hanks brought to life in film. By chance, I've sort of stumbled into situations and events which have turned out in retrospect to be somewhat historic or landmark as to the development of international law or policy. So I hope you will indulge me my somewhat personal reflections. Let me begin with my current role as an ICC judge and more broadly the International Criminal Justice Project as we fondly refer to it. The entrenchment within international law of the concept of adjudicating individual criminal responsibility for grave crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, aggression is a highly ambitious project, perhaps the most contentious within the rubric of the rule of law. History again instructs us, it was always going to be incredibly hard to achieve. In the wake of the horrors and the atrocities of World War II, there were so many important achievements. The Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the Foundation of the United Nations, the International Court of Justice, the International Law Commission. But even with the recent precedent at that time of Nuremberg and Tokyo, and despite very concerted efforts, agreement on the crimes and a permanent international court to adjudicate on them could not be achieved. Understandably so, considering the sensitivities and the fact it's a highly uncomfortable subject, individual accountability for the leaders who are the decision makers. And so the idea, the draft was left with the ILC where it lingered for decades, essentially gathering dust. And in that intervening period, we must remember in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even the 80s, the world soon forgot the tragic lessons of World War II. We witnessed the perpetration of atrocities in international and internal conflicts and those inflicted by despotic regimes against their own populations. Victims watched as alleged perpetrators lived out their lives in power or went into peaceful exile despite the weight of the allegations against them. There was simply no possibility of justice. The prospects for the rule of law then looked as bleak, perhaps even bleaker than what we face today. But gradually those prospects began to change 
not because of an event or a global policy change, leaders didn't come together and agree on a rule of law platform. Rather, as it happens so often in international policy development, a series of somewhat unrelated events, some sadly tragic in nature, created the perfect storm of conditions for a major step forward. In the 1980s, reports surfaced of suspected World War II war criminals amongst the populations who had migrated to places like Australia, Scotland, Canada after the war. It led to commissions of inquiry and legislative reform extending jurisdiction and the establishment of investigative and prosecutorial offices to pursue these cases. As Amanda mentioned, my first introduction to the world of international criminal justice was as a member of one of those offices. The rise of extraterritorial jurisdiction prosecutions began in this World War II context, but quickly expanded to other more recent conflicts and regimes, culminating, of course, in perhaps the most notable UK contribution on the subject, the arrest for extradition of General Pinochet and the ensuing landmark decisions of the House of Lords. Meanwhile, internationally, there's three important developments. The small island nation of Trinidad and Tobago resurrected the ILC draft, not because of atrocity crime, but with a view to an international drug court to address their problem of priority concern. Secondly, the shocking reports of atrocity crime being committed in the conflict in the former Yugoslavia and the horrors of a genocide in Rwanda carried out in plain view, motivated a then functional Security Council to take an extraordinary step to post-World War II international tribunals were established to adjudicate on individual criminal responsibility of those most responsible in relation to those crimes. And suddenly we had a living example of what a court could look like. And there was inspiration not only for other ad hoc courts, East Timor, Sierra Leone, Cambodia, but to resurrect the idea of a permanent court. And finally, that component, which is always necessary, which is what we need right now in many places, political change, a paradigm shift in politics with the fast moving developments that led to the breakup of the Soviet Union and ushered in an era of vastness. For a very brief period, there was a small window of opportunity for change and we all clambered through it, pushing and shoving each other to the other side, to the fertile ground that awaited. And within a relatively short period of time, the idea of a permanent international criminal court came to fruition. As someone who was there that night in, in July 1998 in Rome, I can attest to just how precarious the moment was because right up to the second that the gavel went down on a compromise package, no one in the room, not even Philippe Kirsch, the chair, knew if it would succeed, but succeed it did. And the ICC, where I'm standing tonight, and the Rome statute system were established and with necessary ratifications achieved, four years later, it was operational. This achievement was further enhanced in December, 2017, when agreement was reached to activate the crime of aggression, overcoming problems that everyone said were insolvable. And it came into force in July, 2018. The combination of circumstance and remarkable individual effort had led to an extraordinary step forward for the rule of law. Now, 20 years on, I'm the last person who's gonna stand here and tell you that all is wonderful with the ICC, the expectations of Rome are being met and surpassed. No, bluntly put, the ICC and its operations are the subject of considerable criticism as to effectiveness and efficiency, and it faces multiple challenges. A recent expert report of over 300 pages has set out many of those issues in a frank and thoughtful manner. And I believe that will help guide us forward to meet these challenges. And I can assure you, those of us working at the court or within the mechanisms that surround it are striving every day to improve and progress. So for more on that topic, you can see my other lecture on achievements and challenges for the ICC, or you can ask me a question tonight. But for this lecture, the issue is, does this mean that all the progress is lost? Has the International Criminal Justice Project failed or is it failing? And I'm here to say, of course not. Despite the challenges, the International Criminal Justice Project is alive and well, still advancing at a good pace 
and the establishment of the ICC and the Rome Statute system continues to bring about remarkable changes to the international landscape. First of all, there are 123 parties to the Rome Statute. Almost two thirds of the countries in the world have accepted the court's jurisdiction. And while some states have withdrawn, that number has remained consistent for several years because we get new additions. Further, whether at the speed or in the manner expected, the ICC is proceeding with its business. There are currently seven active cases before the court at various levels arising from seven different situations which are before the court. And bear in mind that building cases within each situation is equivalent to starting the substantive work of an ad hoc tribunal from scratch. In addition, there are 10 preliminary examinations in six different regions. There are 13 situations under investigation, again, in different regions. For core crimes, because we've also had um, convictions for administration of justice offenses, but for the core crimes, there are four fully completed cases, which resulted in three convictions and an acquittal, not an unusual situation for a court complying with the rule of law. And sadly, there are 12 outstanding warrants of arrest. Each situation though, each investigation brings the possibility of accountability where it would likely not have existed before the creation of this court. From that perspective, particularly that of victims, this court represents enormous progress. And secondly, and perhaps even more importantly, much of the criticism and setbacks relate solely to the operation of the court itself as a court, understandably so. There's a lot of attention on the ICC's internal workings. But that focus fundamentally misconstrues the whole purpose and nature of the ICC. What was adopted in Rome in 1998 was not a standalone super court to address atrocity crime. It was not even a court modeled on the example of Nuremberg or the ad hoc tribunals, which had primary jurisdiction and were expected to try all the most responsible for the crimes in question. That is an impossible model for the ICC when it applies to multiple situations in the world and we have three courtrooms. In fact, the perception of the court as such is what has created some of the most significant challenges. The expectations are completely unrealistic. Instead, what was created was a system designed to motivate, to pressure, to cajole states to take up their responsibility, to exercise their right, to investigate and prosecute these crimes, to create conditions of joined state and regional and if necessary, international action that would bring an end to impunity for atrocity crime. The ICC no doubt is a crucial part of that system having complementary jurisdiction, which can be exercised in the last resort when there is no state willing and able to carry out the investigation or prosecution. But the ICC is not the center of the Rome statute system the state proceedings are. And if you look at the record from that perspective, while it may not be happening as fast or as efficiently as we hoped in Rome, there are many successes to note. The Rome Statute crimes are slowly being implemented in national legislation, creating a broader legal base for the punishment of these crimes. And its precepts are being taught in military colleges around the world. For those party to the Rome Statute, and even those who are not, we see allegations today of crimes committed by national militaries or other authorities being brought to light, investigated and prosecuted if appropriate. This effect of complementarity, I appreciate speaking to a UK audience, is not without challenges. It's well known to you. Moreover, one of the most difficult policy issues for the new prosecutor who will arrive next year will be in the area of how complementarity should operate, what the balance should be, and the role of preliminary examinations. But at the end of the day, pressure to investigate and prosecute atrocity crime is an expected and welcome outcome of the Rome Statute system and the drive to end impunity. And another encouraging factor, slowly complementarity is also becoming more of a practical reality with advances in national efforts to address in parallel to the ICC, cases in ICC situation countries. For example, there is a national war crimes chamber in Uganda, currently hearing a case from Northern Uganda. 
there is a special court in CAR in the Central African Republic looking at crimes in that country. There is also the fascinating and important Malaysian Airlines MH17 prosecution by the Dutch in a domestic court in partnership with other states, making it unnecessary for the ICC to intervene, even though arguably it has jurisdiction. And while it is not technically within the jurisdiction of the ICC because of the age of the case, the prosecution of Hissen Habre, the former Chad president, before an extraordinary chamber in Senegal, resulting in his conviction and life sentence for crimes against humanity and war crimes, stands as a perfect example of what the Rome statute system is designed to generate. A prosecution driven by the determination of victims and NGO activists who aided them and supported and steered by the African Union brought long awaited justice to the victims of his regime. There is still a long, long way to go in building national capacity, something that everyone listening tonight can contribute to. But slowly we're beginning to see these important developments in state practice and the bringing to life, if you will, of the Rome Statute system. Thirdly, I think the ICC and the Rome Statute system have proven to be a real and relevant force even beyond the states which fall within the jurisdiction of the court. A friend of mine who was working for the US government at the time once said to me, you know, Kim, every day in the State Department, at the Pentagon, in the White House, there are conversations, high level meetings related to the ICC. That point really struck me, especially when I considered it's not likely a phenomena isolated to the United States. I would say that in and of itself illustrates how seriously the work of the court is taken. Add to this the astonishing step taken by the Trump administration late last year, late this year, in adopting a sanction regime targeting the court personnel, including our prosecutor. It appears the court is very relevant, perhaps too relevant for some. All that having been said, even the most fervent and ardent supporter of international criminal justice cannot help but despair at the large gaps in the Rome statute system, the devastating impunity zones of the world where atrocities are perpetrated in plain sight without much hope, at least for the moment, for any accountability. Syria, 14 Security Council vetoes on any attempts at accountability. Yemen, seemingly abandoned, just to name a few. But even in this darkest corner, there is a beacon of light. There is an important change in that this lack of accountability is no longer accepted or tolerated. Instead, we see unprecedented innovation in the quest for accountability driven by tenacious efforts of victims, activists, NGOs, lawyers, IGOs, states, individually and collectively. Even while conflicts are raging, there have been victims groups and NGOs steadfastly gathering evidence and documenting accounts. When the Security Council failed in its responsibility to the people of Syria, the General Assembly, with much blood on the floor, succeeded in establishing the international, impartial, and independent mechanism for Syria, which is drawing from these NGO sources and other sources and assisting with investigations, preserving evidence, and helping prosecutions only nationally for the moment, but who knows what the future will bring. This was followed remarkably by a similar mechanism for Myanmar in 2018 established by the Human Rights Council, a completely separate UN body. The Security Council has managed to institute as well an investigative team to assist Iraq in the investigation and prosecution of ISIS crimes, driven by considerable efforts on the part of the United Kingdom. And a once unknown international organization in The Hague the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons has gone from primarily monitoring and overseeing weapons disposal to having an investigative capacity and the power to attribute breaches in terms of the use of chemical weapons. And in November last year, the Gambia launched proceedings before the ICJ against Myanmar, alleging violations of the Genocide Convention. To date, provisional measures have been granted and the case continues. And in a related innovative action, evidence document, documenting the alleged atrocities in Syria, such as the UN Commission of Inquiry and the Human Rights Watch report, have been used by the Netherlands to officially notify Syria of its obligations under the Torture Convention, which could ultimately result in another similar proceeding 
before the ICJ. And we've also seen a return to the use of universal jurisdiction by states resulting in a flurry of prosecutions related to a number of situations from Syria to Iraq to the recent case opened last week in Switzerland related to Liberia. This is particularly important since the adoption of the Rome Statute was never intended to bring a halt to such proceedings. To the contrary, it was meant to encourage them. And more broadly, in terms of litigation, NGOs, I know several NGOs working in the UK and private counsel in the UK and elsewhere the world over are making significant progress in using strategic litigation in national, regional, and international courts and fora to advance human rights, including with respect to atrocity crime. What all of this testifies to is the fact that there is a significant change of perspective within the international community. Accountability for atrocity crime is now a permanent fixture on the international agenda, despite all the efforts to quash it. And the establishment of the ICC and the Rome statute system and its work has contributed significantly to creating the conditions that makes this possible. Justice for atrocity crime has gone from being impossible to possible and is now an expectation. It is an expectation that is not for the moment anywhere near being met, but that must be re remain our joint goal. So it's my proposition to you that these advances are part of a continuum of remarkable progress on this criminal justice project, this central rule of law project, despite the dark and dire circumstances which surround it at the international level. What is required now to further advance is strong determination and a very large measure of patience. Let me turn briefly to my other example. It's just too good a story not to mention it in this context. You take a very powerful body, one of the most political bodies in the world, and you effectively force feed it a high dosage of fair process and the rule of law. It's quite a marvelous story. I speak, of course, of the Ombudsperson for the Security Council, Al-Qaeda, now Al-Qaeda and Daesh Sanctions Committee, a role I took on in July 2010 after the establishment of the position in late 2009. There is much to discuss about this unique position, but today I'll just touch on it in a summary way to illustrate the rule of law point. The history may be known to some of you. In October 1999, the Security Council adopted Resolution 1267, which is now infamous, which established a targeted sanctions regime aimed at the members of the Taliban who were in de facto control of much of Afghanistan at the time. A committee was created to identify those to be listed under the regime, and three measures were to be imposed, international travel ban, asset freeze, and weapons prohibition. And the intent was to force the Taliban to turn over Osama bin Laden, whom they were sheltering. It remained a small contained list confined mostly to individuals within Afghanistan until in the wake of the events of 9-11, hundreds of names were added to the list literally overnight. The list was expanded in size and scope becoming a global in nature. At the time, US Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill famously stated, we just rounded up the usual suspects and put them on the list. A fitting description of the exercise of raw power unencumbered by any rule of law. The result was hundreds of people globally experienced the sudden imposition of these measures. They go to their banks, their assets are frozen. No one can tell them why. There's no notice, no reasons, and certainly no recourse, let alone independent review. Now it's notable and comforting when it comes to the rule of law that despite their power, the council faced significant and increasing criticism about the regime starting very soon after the list was expanded. And it came from all different quarters, states, civil society, academics, even the secretary general and his legal advisor took up the cause. But while some improvements were introduced, essentially for seven years, it remained a system which denied to individuals the fundamentals of fair process and human rights protections. And to demonstrate the arrogance, I'm told that as late as December 2007, state officials from a concerned country who suggested the introduction of some form of review were literally shouted down loudly in the Security Council. Those behind the sanctioned regime were highly confident of their absolute power. And with good cause, conventional wisdom was chapter seven of the UN Charter 
was binding on all states and trumped, well, excuse me for using that word, uh, all other treaty obligations. Yet I'm happy to report their confidence was quite misplaced and they vastly miscalculated the stubbornness and creativity of judges. They also misjudged the strength of the rule of law and the instinct to impose it in the face of blatant unfairness. In a decision of September 2008 that sent shockwaves down the halls of the UN headquarters in New York, a most unexpected court, the European Court of Justice, struck down the implementing legislation of the EU with respect to the sanction regime for multiple breaches of the rights related to fair process. The case, of course, was that of Yassine Kadi, a Saudi millionaire on the list since shortly after 9-11, a case doggedly pursued by English solicitors and barristers, despite it having been labeled as impossible to win. With the potential loss of implementation of the sanction regime across the then 27 members of the, of the EU, the all-powerful Security Council was forced to create a review mechanism for the list in December 2009, and the ombudsperson was born. The process as initially designed was a good one, relied on the four principles of fairness needed for the process, which had been outlined by Kofi Annan and Nicholas Michel, his legal advisor, a few years earlier. It provided for petitioners to bring their cases, the ombudsperson to gather information, dialogue, engage with the petitioner and prepare a report on the case. It was an important step forward, but it was unfortunately fatally flawed. Even if the report of the ombudsperson essentially recommended delisting, the decision was still that of the committees and the agreement of all 15 members was required. So one state could veto. I didn't, need not explain to you the impact of that limitation in terms of the rule of law. At the time I feared my term as ombudsperson and my time in New York City would be very short lived. I said from the start that though the process was a confidential one, if I saw unfairness, I would not remain silent they had unwittingly given me the medium to do so through my annual biannual, sorry, my biannual reports on activities, which I vowed to use to out in fairness if necessary. But something remarkable happened, again arising from the combined circumstances and individual effort. Two members of the P5, France and the UK, were caught in a catch-22 between their court and their Security Council obligations. They were desperate to find a solution. A third P5 member of the United States was completely schizophrenic. They detested the idea of independent review, but they feared the consequences of not allowing it. And on the other side, there was a small but determined group of like-minded states advancing the case for fair process, which included Austria, the former chair of the committee when the resolution was adopted, and Germany, the chair of the committee at the time. And yes, there was a pesky Canadian woman obsessed with fair process, as one of the Security Council members noted to me, wandering about, asking questions, and making an awful lot of noise. And I don't know to this day how it was accomplished exactly. Perhaps some P5 representatives were locked in a washroom. But at its first renewal, the resolution was amended. Now, if the ombudsperson recommended a listing, the person would be removed from the list in 60 days, unless there was a consensus decision of the committee to the contrary, all 15, or the matter was sent to the Security Council for a vote. Thankfully, neither of those two latter possibilities has ever happened, and we have just passed the 10 year anniversary of the Office of the Ombudsperson. Putting aside all the arguments of legal sufficiency and adequacy in terms of principles, in practice, what we have for the first time is an independent review mechanism for a decision taken by a committee of the Security Council. For some, this may seem a small step, in terms of the number of cases, we're coming up on 100, and a qualified one in principle, a very minimal advancement. But let me assure you, when I landed in New York City, coming directly from the ICTY in The Hague, the city of international law, it was like entering a parallel universe. When I would speak about fundamental aspects of fair process, basic, I'd receive these blank looks as if I were speaking in a foreign language, or I would be chided, that I was ideal or naive. In my view, the establishment of this mechanism in that universe was an extraordinary victory for the rule of law, one which just a few years on would now be impossible to achieve. I'm gonna bring this to a close and I'm gonna close where I began. 
No one should underestimate the dark times we are in. I certainly do not. On the front line, there are many days of frustration and when it all seems just too hard. I consider seriously at those moments my second career option of bartender. But the lessons of these examples are important ones that I hope resonate with you. Individual efforts can have an extraordinary effect. There's a wonderful story about the ICTY told to me by one of those who worked in the back rooms drafting the statute. No one amongst the diplomats, politicians, high UN officials, bothered the drafters at all in their work because they never thought for a moment that anything would come of this tribunal. For them, it was a grand political move, a threat to the powers of the former Yugoslavia. What they didn't count on was the individuals who came. If you build it, they will come. The investigators, the prosecutors, the defense counsel, the judges, and two women, forces of nature really, Louise Arbour and Carla Del Ponte, who had other ideas. And I hope you recognize that storyline throughout the events I've talked about. The unexpected contribution of the individual, government advisors in a small island state having an idea, a brave Spanish magistrate, and public servants in the extradition field applying the law in an equal way without regard to status, the determined lawyers who pursued an impossible case against all odds, a secretary general and his legal advisor who did what was right, not what was expedient, and in all the stories, victims, stubborn academics and NGOs, all those whose voices cannot be silenced. Sometimes, many times, your individual efforts will not be successful, especially in these challenging times, but on those rare occasions where you do succeed, the rule of law advances. And it is that thought which must keep us all moving forward. When it comes for fighting for and defending the rule of law, I will leave you with the quote of one of my heroes, the 100-year-old Nuremberg prosecutor, Ben Friends, who ends every speech with the exhortation, never give up, never give up, never give up. Thank you very much for tuning in on this Monday night and listening to me. Thank you so much, Judge Pross, for an extraordinary, enlightening and educational speech. Uh, I feel energized uh, just by listening to you. Um, we have uh, a few questions that have been uh, sent through before your speech. Um, so, um, and I'm keeping an eye out for any that might still be coming in from the audience. I'd be happy if anyone does have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and I'll pick some um, for you. Uh, Judge Frost, if you do have some time to answer questions from, from our audience, um, I'll put a couple to you. Um, some of them are devil's advocate questions, I'm afraid, but I, I, I'm sure your uh, your experience and, uh, and optimism will will bat them away. Um, it has been said by some that the ICC can be like a toothless bulldog, um, and that if member states, uh, member state parties decide they don't want to comply with with the orders made by the court, there isn't very much the ICC can do without some sort of police force. Um, what do you say to that? Yeah, there's no question that one of the um, biggest challenges for the court was and remains uh, the whole issue of cooperation. The court has no police force and operates, is dependent on the cooperation of states. I worked uh, in, during the negotiations very much on part nine, which deals with cooperation. I think it's a good scheme. Were I to do it over again today, I'd add some things. I'd add particularly some uh, ideas for states and for the security councils to what they should do to follow up on the cases uh, that where um, referrals are made to them. But I think um, importantly, we see progress over time. As I mentioned, we have 12 outstanding arrest warrants, uh, but uh, you know, uh, six, seven months ago, that number was higher. So you, know, you see progress and also what never gets a lot of attention, the non-cooperation gets a lot of attention. But we have a number of cases going, as I said, and all of them have been built on extraordinary cooperation, even sometimes from states where you wouldn't necessarily expect it because of their rhetoric. So I think the bottom line is it's not a perfect system, but it's the only system that's possible with, uh, with sovereignty. So we, uh, we just have to keep working away at it. 
Yeah, sometimes it strikes me that um, the ICC is a victim of the old uh, adage that you shouldn't let perfection be the enemy of the good. I mean, the fact that there might be limitations to what, what it can do doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have a better world because of it. Um, can I move on? We, we have a couple of other questions that are coming in now. Um, could you tell the audience what, what are the key issues that the ICC is having to grapple with at the moment? I think the question now probably isn't talking about individual cases, but more about the sort of general existential or, or policy issues that the ICC has to engage with. Yeah, well, as I mentioned, 300 page uh, expert report, which is basically documenting uh, issues. Now, a lot, a lot of those, of course, relate also to the, its operation as an international organization, et cetera. I'll, I'll answer that by focusing on the judicial, some of the judicial challenges, because I think they may resonate with, the, with a lot of the audience. Um, for example, we struggle to get consistent practice and a sense of judicial collegiality because we're 18 judges and every three years, six of us go and six of us come, and we all come with our brand new ideas. And so you can imagine it's not easy to move the court along judicially in terms of our jurisprudence and our practices. Uh, so that's a major challenge, which we're working on, we're making success. Uh, the other one I mentioned, because it's already been mentioned in certain contexts, the battle of the common law and the civil law. The ICC is the first truly hybrid court but a lot of the procedures were left for the judges to develop. And you can imagine that's a bit of an enormous challenge. Um, so that's also one of our, our issues. Um, and I suppose just, uh, just the fact that we need to build, as I said, the, this, this consistent practice in, in, our, uh, in our jurisprudence and our cases, uh, and we, uh, we need to move forward in, uh, in doing so. So I think those are just some of the ones that I would touch on, but read the report. There's a whole plethora of them. Absolutely, and I'll definitely have to do that. Um, looking forward, I've got a couple of questions now about the, the future. Um, uh, what one questioner is asking about the um, development of, of crimes that might be added to, to the remit of, of the court, and, and a particular interest these days, probably the ecosystem destruction crime uh, or potential crime. Um, are you able to comment on sorts of developments the court might make in its um, subject matter jurisdiction? Well, I, you know, I can do it in the, in the abstract. I mean, obviously, um, and amending um, the Rome Statute is a very difficult process and adding crime is a very difficult process. We have done some small amendments over the past several years, um, issues that were added and states are still putting things forward. Uh, that would be a huge step, though, uh, I think. Uh, but I think, as, as I mentioned, I mean, this court was created to reflect those crimes that the world identifies as grave crimes. And given the, the push in that field, at some point in time, in my view, it'll probably be something that is taken up and pushed forward. It may take, as aggression did, a number of years. Uh, but I think it's, it's certainly well worth, it's again, something well worth pushing us in, in the future and trying to, to advance that for, uh, for the Rome Statute. And I don't know if you'll be willing to answer this question, but if you did have the power to amend the statute or anything else that needed to be done, what, what is the most significant single change that you would make um, to the ICC and its processes? As I mentioned, I'd go back and, and put a lot more teeth into what the states uh, are supposed to do in referral situations, and I would take on the Security Council. I mean, we gave them a role to be able to refer cases to the court. They refer sure. to situations, and then they don't even follow up on their own resolutions, and the court gets blamed for that. It's really the council. So I would focus on the cooperation regime, not because I think it's failing, but because I think we could do a lot more with it. There's probably other things, but I think being a judge, I'll just stay away from it. <laughs> and do, do you think, again, maybe, maybe as a judge, you, you don't want to comment on this question, but do you think there's, there's more that could be done to encourage more countries to sign up? And you mentioned that it's a, it, it's a very large number of countries if you, you count the countries, but again, playing devil's advocate by a number of people on the planet, it, um, it falls a bit short of what it could be. Is there something that could be done, do you think, to pressurize or encourage greater sign up? Yeah, you know, I mean, everyone focuses on the big names that aren't there, but quite frankly, uh, this court was always about small and medium states and, and the protection that this court brings. 
Um, so I, I think more there's political issues, but there's also just practical issues. And there's a lot of groups working to try and convince small states, like the last state to join was Kiribati, the tiny Pacific Island state, who was, they were convinced finally of, of why it's important for a small island state. So I think those kinds of efforts as to why it's important to join this family of the Rome statute. Uh, I think there's a lot could be done there. And of course, there's the, with our Assembly of States parties, the political body, there's lots of dialoguing going on, uh, even with some who are not too fond of us at the moment. Well, um, thank you very much. And thank you for answering uh, all those questions uh, that are coming from the audience. Um, I mean, it falls to me to, to thank you for, for giving the, the speech to us today. Um, it is uh, no exaggeration to say that the rule of law, the annual law, rule of law speech is the highlight of the uh, International Committee's calendar. Uh, and uh, your speech uh, was as good as any that uh, I have heard in the uh, decade and a half that we've been having these, these talks. And I just wanted to thank you very much from that. Listening to you, um, you described yourself at the beginning as having a uh, some a career something like Forrest Gump, but I I couldn't couldn't see any similarity at all. Your your career, from what it, uh, I've heard and read, uh, seems to be one of a, a determined woman steadily progressing up to the the status of of a, a judicial member of the ICC. Um, and it looks to me as if your career has been uh, uh, steadily and inevitably leading to that after your involvement with the Rome Statute uh, before the signing and and subsequently and and it was a sort of an extraordinarily upbeat and positive talk as as amanda promised um i found it truly educational illuminating and, and inspiring uh, for you even to turn um an executive order by the outgoing president of the us um demanding sanctions on the icc personnel into a positive uh, was uh, was really an indicator of how how it seems to me you have a a fantastically optimistic uh, turn of phrase. Uh, and I, I ask myself sometimes when, when considering the difficulties that the ICC faces, uh, whether we really would want to live in a world where the ICC didn't uh, exist. Um, most, of, most lawyers who um, have uh, normally from childhood a sense of injustice, a burning sense that things should be done differently at home or abroad, would be horrified if we went back, I think, to a world where nobody even tried to bring individuals to account for the most horrendous crimes that can possibly be committed uh, and they went uh, particularly in a day and age where everything is so immediate where social media and television can be on the scene uh, anywhere in the world so quickly if that went without redress I think it would be a much poorer world so um, thank you for staying uh, with the law and not going into bar attending and thank you so much for your fantastic speech today uh, if we were in person uh, and i know you wanted to give this speech in person and i really wanted you to as well if we're in person i would at this point hand over a copy of the book which um, amanda shamelessly plugged at the beginning of the talk um, uh, for you you don't have to go to wildies or any good bookshop uh, everyone else should certainly buy a copy but when we do get to meet, and I hope it's soon, uh, let me hand over a, a formally a copy of this uh, collection of the speeches. And, and as I mentioned to you before, your speech, um, it's of some uh, note and, and a nice symmetry that the very first of the rule of law speeches in 2007 was from your compatriot, Judge Philippe Kirsch, the first president of, of the court on which you, you now sit. So thank you again. Um, might I just take this opportunity uh, to just uh, give some closing comments about the International Committee for those um, for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, I'm the chair of the International Committee of the Bar Council and, uh, and we have various different roles that we carry out, including promoting the bar and its professional opportunities um, around the world. Uh, and we also engage with our sister bar associations around the world to share best practice on professional matters, regulatory and professional standards and so on. Um, but for, for today's purposes, it's important for me to emphasize uh, an, an, uh, another role that we carry out, and that is to promote, to highlight and support the rule of law internationally. Um, and as uh, Amanda pointed out, that has been troublesome for us at home, um, but that is not what the International Committee focuses on. We focus on trouble abroad. Uh, and as Amanda pointed out, we have had cause this year to support our brethren and peoples in countries as different and far flung as Zimbabwe, Poland, Hong Kong, China, Hungary and Samoa. 
Uh, those places, uh, like so many places in the world, as Judge Prost said, have day-to-day -day problems. The fact that we take for granted this environment, this safe rule of law uh, environment that we grow up in does not mean that we should forget um, all those people in the world, and it's probably a majority of the people who actually have to actively monitor where the rule of law um, is being upheld um, in their home states. And many of the members of the bar, I'm proud to say, are very active in promoting human rights, constitutional issues and the rule of law around the world and have been instrumental, as I think Judge Prost mentioned, in uh, establishing and carrying on this project, as she called it, of international uh, justice. So um, I, I, I'll just add, uh, for those of you who are interested, um, a, a plug for the International Committee. Please sign up to our international newsletter. You have to do that these days via my bar online. Uh, that shows all all the things that we do from month to month around the world and advertises all the opportunities that you can take advantage of if you're interested in developing your practice or learning more about what we do for the rule of law. And I would encourage every single barrister to have a look at, that, at the international pages of the Bar Council website and sign up to the, the newsletter which comes out every couple of months or so. Uh, and as we finish this uh, rather painful year 2020, I think uh, all of us have that sense of optimism that Judge Pross brought into her speech for the next year. And I'd love to channel the positivity uh, of Judge Prost and hope that uh, all of us in the profession and at the Bar Council can be those brave individuals whose stories that Judge Prost has given to us tonight in what is uh, what was a fantastic, interesting, illuminating and optimistic speech. Judge Prost, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Good night.